Hello everyone. Welcome. It is the latest Tuesday before New Comic Day and Andy and I are here. We've gathered up all the big sort of relevant issues we think everyone's going to have questions about, want to know about. We've read them and we're going to do our best to do a generally spoiler free <laughs> review of these yes. comics and the other dozens we have off to the side. Um, so I'm Jason. I'm Andy. And we're with Infanty Flux Comics out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Hopefully uh, this isn't your first show with us. We've been doing this now for, I'd say, well over a year. Yeah. Um, so trying to prepare everyone for New Comic Day. New Comic Day can be very overwhelming. Yes. More all the time, it seems like. <laughs> Especially with all these smaller publishers putting out new number ones. And basically all people have to go on is the cover. And it's like, well, does that look good to you? But... That's what we're here for. I know, and sometimes a book will just heat up. You know, like you'll <laughs> you'll hear about Joker, and you'll be like, "Well, I'm reading too many Batman books." Yeah. But by issue four, you're like, "Well, I wish I knew a little what was going on." Yeah. So we try to catch you up a little bit too while we review the new books. So with that said, let's go ahead and begin. Yes. So <laughs> it's funny we call this a uh, spoiler-free show. Uh, this is almost a. I don't know if I could spoil this book if I wanted to, because I am still churning it around in my head, dissecting it. This is Bunny Mask, number one, from Aftershock by Paul Tobin. Paul Tobin uh, actually has been the kind of main writer on all of the Witcher comics that have been yeah. coming out um, from Dark Horse over the past few years. Uh, he's done a lot of really interesting things. And... So when this originally was solicited, everything, we saw it, um, I don't know, you see the cover, you think maybe like a zombie a little bit, or some kind of supernatural... I, I, I definitely got a, like a serial killer vibe to me yeah. for some reason. You know, the, I guess the mask, the hide identity. Yeah, so I, while I was reading this, I was writing like everything that was going on, trying to keep track of it. So this begins with a... Um, like child safety officers, two of them going to this house um, that's kind of this dilapidated house in the woods. Um, it cuts between them on their way there and this man who is is pretty much literally speaking nonsense. Like someone even calls him out at one point and be like, I have no idea what you're saying. Huh. Um, and he is has a little girl there named B, B-E-E, -E, and he is chiseling her bottom teeth. And she doesn't seem to mind it. I know, this it just gets crazy. Okay. So, of course, these uh, child safety officers show up. And they're like, sir, we're gonna, we've are gonna we heard reports. We need to see the child and everything. And uh, let's just say, without too much detail, we are now down to one safety officer <laughs> at this point. And this goes just into this... The one of them wakes up inside of a cave, and this man is forcing him and this girl B to mine in this cave because he says um, there is a voice uh, called. Let's see what does he call it? Um, oh, it's something weird that's telling him that uh, they've got to keep digging. Okay. And the girl's like, well, sometimes I hear the voices, too. And there's some big something under the ground. And this just keeps going on until they do find something. There is cave paintings in here of rabbits. And I, I don't know how to not spoil it, but there is some crazy stuff that happens down there. The character on the cover is part of it. And then there's a big time jump, and it just gets crazier from there. So it's hard to explain because I didn't super understand it, but I liked it. I thought this was really interesting. And what we saw just recent, you know, today, is we ordered a decent amount of this book. We, we did. Yeah, and we, we are down to, like, next to nothing a left. Lo a lot of people have ordered this book between when the last order date happened yep. and when it arrived. Like, this has picked up steam somehow. I don't know if it's the covers. Um, maybe maybe the people who did it went on podcasts. But th this yeah. is a fairly hot book for an Aftershock book. Oh, the, so the voice that talks to him is called um, Snitch. And Snitch keeps telling this guy 
to do these crazy things and uh i don't know it progresses to a like the in the future stuff is really interesting because um there's some more stuff about this character that they now call bunny mask and you may think you know who this character is and then it's got a big last page reveal where maybe not um so it is very it's supernatural but not in the sense of like ghosts and stuff it's almost like ancient secrets underground and what does this mean and what are these kind of forces that are working here and um it, i i like that aspect of it because it it reminded me more of maybe more occult horror than like supernatural paranormal horror well i'll tell you you know rabbits they look cute and cuddly mm -hmm. but they're actually very destructive creatures yeah. Um, they're very invasive, and so I could see how maybe occult lore would be like, these creatures are bad. They yeah. eat up your garden, you know. They make you want to be Elmer Fudd, but, <laughs> you know, less speech impediment, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, so I, I really do recommend Bunny Mask. Uh, I think everyone needs to read it for themselves to see what's going on, but if you like that kind of um, maybe pseudo-occult or underground horror um with it seems like a plot that could be pretty uh, ongoing because we don't know a whole lot about this bunny mask character but it's kind of a looming thing through the entire book so i i really liked it um we've got some variants for it left so we have the bunny make, mask make your own mask variant yeah if you have a tiny head <laughs> your eyes are really close together that might fit on Megan. <laughs> <laughs> Get her in here. So we have that variant, and then we have the 1 in 15 Adlard variant that we are selling for our customers for $20. And I feel like this cover is the most indicative of what the book feels like. So you've got the caves, you got the creepy bunny mask girl in the background. Definitely, definitely cool. Um, I'll want to talk about issue two when it comes out because hopefully by that point people have read it and we've gotten a little bit more answers about who this character is and what the overall story of this book is going to be yeah charlie adler doing the one in 15 he always attaches himself to the most interesting projects you know of course uh the big springboard was walking dead yeah you know he started that series and all the character designs but you know since then he's just done a lot of cool stuff um you know, I just always like to see when he's involved in yeah, a project. Yeah, you can definitely, you know his stuff when you see it now, because you saw it for 100-something issues of yeah. Walking Dead. Yeah. So, um, I read DC Pride. This book has been announced and has been on the way for quite some time. Yes. So, that is releasing today in, in all the stores that, that sell DC on Tuesdays. On Wednesday, some stores still, still have it where their DC is on Wednesday. And this is a one-shot for Pride Month. It has nine different stories in it by a lot of great creative teams. Uh, I'm going to tell you some of the people who are behind this. So it's got James Tynion, Steve Orlando, Marika Tamaki, Klaus Jansen, Vida Ayala. And these stories, um, you know, because I, I can't sit here and tell you all nine of the yeah. stories. I mean, the, you know, it's story it's, time. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a triple sized issue. But still, most of these stories are not full comic size since mm -hmm. there's nine of them. Each one's about the third of size of a comic, maybe a little less. But you get characters. You got Harley and Ivy in there. You have Alan Scott, Jess Chambers, and Andy Curry. Mm -hmm. You got, um, in, in fact, in their story, I will say there's a new villain whose name is Refleck, as in reflection, oh, Refleck. Okay. And he's a lot like Mirror Master. Mm. So, but new villain in there. There's Batwoman, John Constantine, Midnighter, Pied Piper. But I'd say the main thing that, um, if anybody's specking on this comic for, which, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good read, but for spec purposes, is the first appearance of Dreamer, who's a character from Supergirl, the TV mm -hmm. show. So this is Dreamer's first appearance in comics. Dreamer has a pretty big part of this one, mm -hmm. too. And um, Dreamer's costume design outfit is great yeah i think dreamer has a really cool look so i'm grabbing at least one or two just to put aside mm -hmm. hopefully we'll see more of dreamer and uh you know the power set's pretty interesting yeah. as well so that's uh sort of the summary on dc pride there's a lot of variants for this we've actually sold out of most of them yes 
So we have a lot of other things we're going to go over. So um, don't have the variants to show you, but you can find those hopefully at your local store. So back to even more messed up serial killer type things. We have Joker number four. Yes, Joker number four. And it's hard to not talk about this book every time it comes out. You know, we still have people coming in, asking for it, picking up one through three, and now they can get number four. This is so good by James Tynan. And this issue, uh, I kind of feel like is the culmination of a lot of little pieces we've got through the first three issues. We have Gordon on his mission to potentially kill Joker. We had our storyline with Vengeance, the daughter of Bane, uh, which seemed to be kind of separate before this and what is her goals and what's she after. Um, and we have Joker. What's he doing in Brazil, lounging at this very nice <laughs> uh, vacation house? This issue brings all the stories together. We do get a... Uh, Joker versus what he calls She Bane, which I think is a great She Hulk she reference. <laughs> but uh, Joker versus Vengeance. And it's really interesting because Gordon is sitting there with his gun, and this is his opportunity. He can take it. This right. is, you know, he doesn't know how Vengeance would react to him taking out Joker here. But Joker's kind of had the upper hand for most of their interactions the past couple of issues. But now he has an opportunity. Does he take it? I don't know. He definitely has to think about it. Like Gordon overthinks everything sometimes. I mean, if I were there and She Bane or Vengeance showed up, it's like, you want to see how that plays out. <laughs> You're like, I just want to wait <laughs> yeah. and see. Um, but, of course, if you give Joker too long, yep. he's always got a trick up his sleeve. Uh, I will also say there is some characters that we saw previously the um, the Sampson family, who I believe were in issue two, right. have uh, they come back into this, and something happens to one of them that I feel like we are setting up a new. You, we're seeing the creation of a new character. Um, Joker does some pretty nasty things to one of them in very specific ways that I could definitely see them showing up with a big reveal about a new look they have or a lack of a better term after joker gets done with somebody oh boy but i think i mean it's really interesting um also we find uh barbara and stephanie brown are back in gotham and they're trying to find out all the information they can about the people who hired commissioner gordon to go after joker and it seems like the person that they're following may have an idea that they're being followed. Mm. And while Barbara is hunting them, someone else in the shadows may be hunting Barbara. So we've got so many cool elements going on in this one. Um, Joker may have a job for, for Jim Gordon in this one, which is a funny kind of <laughs> twist. Uh, there's a lot going on in this. There's a lot of new mystery set up. A lot of things Joker says where it kind of reveal in the previous issues that maybe Joker wasn't the one who's responsible for A-Day. Right. And Joker pretty much lays out, these are the reasons why it wasn't me. And they're very convincing. You read them and you go, that's true. This is not necessarily Joker's style. So highly, highly recommend this one. Um, I feel like we are uh, on the course for some some pretty explosive story parts. I think Tynion, he's in a competition with himself. He's like, what can I write better, Batman or Joker? Yeah. And I'm going to have the series fight just the way that the characters <laughs> Just would, between would myself. Battle. In the end, I always win. But, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, highly recommend Joker. I mean, I, I still think this is one of the best books coming out. Um and a last little thing is uh, 
is Vengeance actually a bad guy? You know, we kind of went into this character being the daughter of Bane. Right, assume that. Assume that they're sure. a villain. Maybe they're not. Huh. Definitely read this issue. Make up your mind for yourself, but I think it leaves a lot of mystery out there. Um, there is a few variants for this. So, of course, we do get that backup punchline story in this one. And we have a punchline variant cover. And then we have the uh, Perio, really, really creepy, creepy Joker variant. All right, so time for Jason's Heroes Reborn Corner. <laughs> this is Again. the second to last time I'll be doing this because this is the penultimate issue. This is issue number six. Each issue is followed a member of the Squadron Supreme. I have thoroughly enjoyed these. They're really fun reads. Uh, they're definitely a bit on the mature side for mm. Marvel, I would say, and this one continues in that tradition. So this one follows Power Princess, which, it's funny, I have seen other sites write about how Marvel is stealing off of Wonder Woman. I mean, that is the whole point of this. <laughs> the whole point of this is the Squadron Supreme, which, you know, they were, they're back from like Avengers number what was it, 40 or something? Yeah, they're a very old team. Yeah, very old team. They were supposed to be a Justice League analog, and so this is an alternate reality mm -hmm. where the Avengers never formed, the Squadron Supreme took over. They're a darker, meaner version of the Justice League. Um, in fact, I the way I describe Power Princess is, what if Wonder Woman were even more powerful than Wonder Woman, and she was uh, just totally full of herself? That is Power Princess. <laughs> she is a hard-drinking, villain-killing, naughty Wonder Woman. Uh -oh. She has bad thoughts, and she <laughs> follows them, even though she still sees herself as a hero. She's a hero because she can kill anyone she wants. And that's kind of how the Squadron Supreme controls things in this mm -hmm. uh, alternate reality. Because this is the regular Marvel Universe that's been twisted. Mm -hmm. This isn't an alternate universe. Somebody has affected the Marvel Universe, and heroes were born. Um, so, I mean, in this, more about her, she's got a magic mirror that can reach into other dimensions. She forgets, like, where she wants it. She uses it to just find new forms of alcohol. <laughs> uh, she has a story she tells. This is just, th this will sound like I'm spoiling stuff. I'm not. There's so much that goes on in this book. But one other thing she says, uh, just to give you, this is to give you flavor of the book. She talks about how you haven't lived, um, in her opinion, until you, she's talking about her time with Namor, about them making love on the bottom of the ocean while feeding Nazis they just killed to sharks. <laughs> you know, it's stuff like that. I mean, Jason Aaron is having a fun time writing these darker versions mm -hmm. of the Justice League. And I, I, I'm having a good time reading about them. They're not great characters, and you, you know that eventually it's going to come to a head, that the, that the Avengers are going to mm -hmm. battle with them. I mean, yeah. it's already been sort of announced. Um, so let's see, as far as what else with this one, um, let's see. So in the background, the other characters are starting to remember the real Avengers. Mm. Uh, I can't tell you who it's too much of a good revelation in this one, but power princess does go up against a powerful ex Avenger who is kind of remembered the way reality should be. And so the forces are starting to align. We've already seen Captain America, Blade, Phoenix, um, Black Panther, and they're going to get a new ally in this one mm -hmm. by the end. I can't believe there's only one more issue. There is the Heroes Return, Heroes Return one shot that follows. So I think that makes sense because I don't see how they're going to wrap this all up. The Squadron Supreme, like I was telling Andy about this before the show, they are so powerful. They mm -hmm. have made them out. Like between Power Princess, Hyperion and Dr. Spectrum, they're just insanely mm -hmm. powerful. Like, we're talking, like, killing gods, killing Galactus like he's nothing. So how the Avengers are going to beat them down, I am not sure. we got a few variants I want to show you on this, and then we're going to talk about some of the one-shots that have come out. Here is the training card variant with Power Princess herself on it. Then we have the action figure variant which I have nothing to say about if this has anything to do with the <laughs> issue. 
And then we have the Stormbreakers variant showing off the work of R.B. Silva. I love how big She-Hulk is. That is a big She-Hulk. Yep. I, I will say this does not happen in the issue. I like to mention if covers happen or don't, because yeah. I always wonder about that. And lastly, there's this great 1 in 25 Cho variant that we're selling for $35. I think this is great because, of course, Cho has done Wonder Woman. Yeah, it's this very similar. Very way. And so here's him doing Marvel's Analog, which is done very knowingly tongue in cheek. All right, so next up, I want to talk about. S Savage Squadron Savage. I'm sorry. <laughs> Heroes Reborn Squadron Savage. So this is the uh, one of two one-shots that come out about Hero Re Heroes Reborn this week. It is a team that is formed by Elektra. Now, she is not the person they're ultimately working for. There's someone in the shadows who runs the Squadron Savage. They're the people that do the dirty work that the Squadron Supreme can't be linked to. Mm. You know, so when something real bad happens, they just need him killed, and the media might find out about it, they go with these people. So it begins with Elektra having to pull Punisher back into the mix. Punisher has a family, he's retired, mm -hmm. and she has to give him a good enough reason to rejoin the team for one last mission. And you know <laughs> how that classic. goes. You know how one last mission yeah. goes when, when, when you're happy. In fact, honestly, it doesn't quite go the way you would expect. Um... So, this team, they have a mysterious leader who may not be letting them keep all their memories in between mm -hmm. missions. I mean, when you have people doing some really dirty stuff, might not be, you know, good for you to let them remember everything they're doing. Um, so, they have to stop someone who has the power to reshape reality. Now, that, that made me stop when I was reading. I was like, oh, are we going to find out who's behind the whole Heroes Are Born mm. thing? Because that's the whole setup. I will not reveal that. But I will say the person who they're trying to stop does have the power to have done this. Whether they have or haven't, mm. I'm not telling. Um, so let's see. Uh, oh, so a whole other team is introduced in this. It is a new team that they have to go up against. And to get to their target, it is a just bloody fight. And that's what Jason Aaron and the other people who have been writing these have been doing. They're like, oh, cool. Because this isn't the regular Marvel reality, we can really have fights. We can yeah. really have death. We can really have consequence. And it's not like everybody dies, but the fights are cool. And things happen that you'd expect to happen. It's not like, you know, when I grew up watching an old G.I. Joe cartoon, <laughs> they'd always shoot the... The, the the airplane, but they'd always parachute away. Yeah. They win, but there's no consequence. These all have consequence. So that is uh, Squadron Savage. Here is the variant. This is the Blatt variant. Watching Electra lead the team is really cool, too. She's actually a very effective leader in this. So the last one I want to talk about, this is the last one shot, is Here is Her Born Night Gwen. This is one of the most ordered one-shots yeah. we've had of this. Everyone's very interested in Gwen as any different sort of superhero. She's very, uh, you can apply her to a lot of different skins <laughs> and it, it works. Yeah, so uh, this, was, this was pretty interesting. So Gwen works at Ravencroft Asylum by day. She is a psychiatrist trying to rehabilitate the likes of people like Bullseye. But at night, she is Night Gwen. Now, why is she Night Gwen? How does this, you know, tie her in to Night Hawk? Mm -hmm. You know, that is sort of re revealed in this. But I have to say, that's not the major part of this. Like, they do kind of reveal why, why do you call yourself Night Gwen, but that's just a little blurb in this. Uh, what this really is about is she, there's a villain called the Jackal. It's kind of her main villain. Mm -hmm. And the Jackal happens to know a lot about her to the point that it might be something she knows. She enacts a lot of detective work in that, much like you'd see out of, oh, I don't know, Batman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, it, it's a big mystery of her trying to figure out who the Jackal is. There's a cool revelation at the end about who, who it is. And there's more about just sort of her life. It's, I don't know, we, you know, Gwen Stacy's been dead for the majority of the Marvel Universe. Yeah. And now that they brought her back in these different iterations, it's neat to just see, here's how her life could have gone. Mm -hmm. And so here's another what if to her life.
So um, we have a variant. This is the Miyazawa variant with her in Nighthawk. And then we also have this 1 in 10 Garen design variant for $25. And that is your weekly Heroes Reborn roundup. <laughs> Just one more week to go. Well, I have my own slightly smaller corner, not as big as Jason's uh, I, I Heroes Reborn cover. I guess it has to do with Star Wars. Nope. Oh, not I'm wrong. this time. Oh, the Hellfire Gala. Okay. This is a Hellfire Gala corner time thing. Um, so I really enjoyed uh, last week's issues of the Hellfire Gala story. And it's very interesting because there are... There are a few issues that you can tell are the key issues to reading the Hellfire Gala. They kind of even, not confirmed, but at the end of the issue there is a reading order, and certain issues are in red, and I feel like those are the issues that maybe are the key issues to read. We've kind of had this... Red alert, don't miss. Don't yeah, miss. we've kind of had this theory since House and Powers of X that the red ones have big significance. Um, so one that doesn't have the red is Excalibur. This is Excalibur number 21. Um, so this has the teams like uh, the new Captain Britain and the Excalibur team at the Hellfire Gala, but mostly it is following their their storylines that has been going on through Excalibur. So not super uh, affected either way with the gala. It's still uses a lot of their heroes and villains and everything in it, but uh, still really cool issue, and they're all wearing their uh, crazy, beautiful attire. But the main one, this is X-Men number 21. And I feel like, so Marauders was a very big part of the Hellfire Gala. I feel like this is the next big part in it. Um, this begins with Namor, basically on Krakoa, which, you know, Namor is actually the first mutant. That was the thing that they revealed at one point. Um, right. And if there was any reason not to like Namor, which there are plenty, uh, he has some of his, his moments in this when uh, Professor X and Magneto walk up, or Charles and Eric, as he calls them, who are in almost comedically fancy attire, like Magneto has a, a, a white top hat and they're both wearing like pearl and gold and it's so over the top. I, it's hard to believe Magneto would ever wear something like this, but it's still, it still, it fits in with the vibe. And it's interesting because um, Namor basically calls the, not calls them out, but is kind of like, I know what you're doing. Because he basically says, how goes building your empire? And Professor X is like, it's going pretty well. It's a very interesting conversation where um, Professor X and Magneto invite Namor to be on the Quiet Council. The, as they're expanding, they're like, uh, we'll make room for you. And of course, Namor comes back with, if I showed up, someone would give up their seat for me because that's how important I am. And, very interesting conversation between Namor and uh, Professor X and Magneto. But then it goes on to kind of more of what's going on in the the uh, the party scene. Uh, I believe this issue actually has three different artists. So the middle story is interesting because, as you know, we've had the, this voting for who is going to be on this new X-Men team. Right. This is where um, the vote is actually cast, which is really cool, where Jean Grey basically uh, telepathically taps into every mutant in the world and basically says, tell me why you deserve to be on the X-Men. Hmm. So, and in a few minutes, she says, okay, here's your new X-Men team and calls each of them out. It's really, really interesting. Huh. Um, there's some... It's funny because the X-Men are very, I don't know, the, the way they're acting, you have characters like um, Human Torch there and a few others. Uh, I believe it's Human Torch talking to Doctor Strange 
and he's like, what's going on? Because he's, of course, not getting contacted. Right. And Doctor Strange, being a telepath, he can kind of tap into what they're doing. And it's a very interesting thing of, like, the outside world is not allowed to be in the X-Men's process of doing things. And it's interesting, it's a little unnerving. Um, so does she call out the new team members, or is it more she's like, okay, I got it, but No, it's she not. calls them out. Okay. And it, there's a panel of each character being like, your name, and, you cool. know, them kind of either responding to it or just showing them. I'm going to check uh, that out later for sure. Really, really cool. And then you have a big group picture of all the characters together, um, which will be going on into the new um, X-Men number one that will be coming out later. Uh, and then the third part of this issue, which is one of the most interesting parts we've got in the Hellfire Gala so far, which is funny because it always uh, tends to be around Emma Frost. I think Emma Frost is such a cool character in this storyline. And through these past few issues, um, we've heard that the end of the night is going to end with fireworks. And that... Um, oh, you're want, going to want to stay around for the fireworks, and that's how we're going to cap off the night. And you kind of had this sense of the entire thing that this is not normal. Like, right. there's, there's something behind this. It's not going to be the fireworks you see at downtown Disney no. at the end of the night. No, this is, this is the X-Men's version of fireworks, um, or a psychic's version of fireworks. Very interesting. Uh, and Emma Frost gives a little speech, and then... It's very much in the style of Hickman of the speech she gives, which is very, not cryptic, but um, almost not like how normal humans speak. It, it's almost this larger-than-life speech. And I will say, based on what happens in the speech, and I show Jason, be did. like, can you help me decipher this? We dissected the last bit it's of like this. It's like four panels. And it's like, is this what it looks like? Um, there, There is maybe, I don't know how to say it, maybe first appearances, maybe more information about what Planet Size X-Men is going to be about. There, there are vague figures seen yes. within what looks to be a planet-shaped thing, but if it were anything, it'd be cameos. Now, this could be characters bringing back it, who knows what it is, because it's so vaguely seen. So yeah. we'll make that clear here. If this is anything, it would be cameos. But it seems very important. It could also be us misinterpreting, because I... it was just a few <laughs> panels. I hope we are dead on, and this is breaking news. But uh, it's really, really cool. It looked important. Um, the other thing I will say is, of course, not only is it X-Men at this gala, no, it's not only Avengers and Fantastic Four, and various heroes and villains here and there. There's also celebrities that show up to this. And uh, I will go ahead and say, um, there is someone at the bar who is trying to get a drink and are, is having trouble, and Cyclops comes up and it's like, oh, I'll help, and he gets this guy a drink. And I can't tell from the art who this person is, but it's clear it is somebody. Um, I tried to do a little digging. I could not, I couldn't pinpoint the face, but then someone else, uh, shows up and I don't know if it's a spoiler cause it doesn't really, it doesn't involve the story, but, uh, Kevin Feige of the Marvel Cinematic Universe heading shows up and basically asks Cyclops, uh, so what's your deal? And I think this is really funny because of this long uh, thing of, like, we're waiting for the X-Men to hit the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And in this, we have Cyclops tell Kevin Feige, this is who I am, and this is the X-Men, and this is why we do what we do. And I think that's a super interesting nod yeah, to fans. A very big nod. And then as Cyclops is walking away, he's like, I'll, I'll catch up with y'all. And he's, this is my deep diving, but he's talking to Kevin Feige and this other guy that's at the bar. And this guy who's at the bar could be important. If someone can decipher who he is, does he have connections to the film industry? Is he a director? Is he a writer? Um, 
definitely, I mean, wild speculation, but something very interesting to look in on. So really enjoyed these Hellfire Gala issues. I'm very excited now about Planet Size X-Men. I feel like very big things will happen in that because the way they're setting up in this, it it feels like it's going to be a defining moment for the X-Men. Yeah, what I what I said to Andy, and once again, this is just us speculating, I was like, giant size X-Men, what happened in that? They revealed new team members, new major team members. So now we have planet size. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Real quick, here's some of the variants. So we have Excalibur, we have Captain Marvel, her crazy cool outfit. We have the 1 in 50 design variant for X-Men with Jean Grey on there. I love that they don't only put out these designs, but like the characters wear them in the books. Like I, I feel sorry for the artists who are like they give them some of the weird ones. They're like, how is someone supposed to walk through a room dressed like this? We have the 1 in 50 Jimenez Pride variant, the Virgin Pride variant with... Uh, Mystique on there that we have for $30. We have the Spider-Man Villains variant by uh, Emma Lupicchio for X-Men. Then lastly we have the Connecting variant with Cyclops for X-Men. I have to say, in the book, his costume actually looks pretty cool. I, I like the design of it. And then we have the concept design for X-Men. Really cool with Colossus in the center. And that is my corner of the week. There, there was a lot to talk about with that X-Men issue. Yes, like I, a lot of speculation. I, I've seen the parts that you, you showed me, but I really want to check that whole thing out. Yeah. So, I read a new one from Image Skybound is the Six Sidekicks of Trigger Keaton. This was a fun read. So, this is by Kyle Starks, who is known for Rock Candy Mountain, and he also did the Mars Attacks comics. Oh, cool, yeah. Yeah, Kyle Starks was behind that. So, Trigger Keaton was an action TV movie star, an, an action TV and movie star, whose fighting style was just as brutal as his personality. <laughs> as in, nobody liked him. He's just a jerk. You get to see flashbacks with the guy. If you like him, then you're probably a jerk, too. Uh, he is just not nice to anybody. He's just full of himself. Um, just not a nice guy. Well, he turns up dead, and six of his past sidekicks, that is people who were sidekicks on different TV shows or movies he was, he was in, they all show up at you know his viewing and funeral after he's been killed, and they don't get along. Okay, they don't see eye to eye. Some of them replaced other mm -hmm. ones. Well, one of them suggests that Trigger might have been murdered, and as much as some of the others don't care or might have even liked to have seen him die, uh, the the one who suggests this kind of pulls them into this web of humorous intrigue as they start investigating if he were murdered, which leads them down this rabbit hole of TV and, and movie action star <laughs> and stuntmen. So that is the general premise of the six sidekicks of Trigger Key. And very, if you've read Kyle Stark stuff, it's very much his style mm -hmm. of writing. Um, so it's mostly, it's I don't know, his stuff, it's so hard to say how much of it's humor. I'd say it's 25% humor and 75 Five percent just indie comic fun. Yeah. I've got it's got a few variants. The only one that I'm going to show is the Pride variant, which this is one of the sidekicks here, and that is by Ed Lucy. That variant is by Ed Lucy. Cool. One that I, of course, super excited to talk about. Geiger number three. So, like everybody knows at this point, Geiger number one, big hit. Yeah. Um, a lot of people, kind of after the fact, a lot of people asked for it, but then word got out and we sold out of it multiple times. 
And what I love about this is now reading issue three is the pacing of this is great. So I was interested last issue, we took kind of a detour to follow these two kids who are escaping Las Vegas. And at the end, kind of ran face to face into Geiger. In this one, um, we pick up there, but we're still getting some more backstory now on Geiger and why he's doing what he's doing and how he got how he is, um, which is pretty surprising. So he is, it's kind of a story within a story. So we have the guys from the first issue that were like sitting around telling the story about him. Right. They pop up in a panel and then we have, it's like they paused their story to tell the even more backstory on Geiger. Okay. And we find out uh, about him, the early days of him guarding the fallout shelter that he sent his wife and kids into. And the kind of the first initial attacks from different people trying to get in there, learning he had these big weapons caches and everything to defend them. Um, and it's very interesting because we find out what's inside of that. I thought it would take a long time to get to um, the family uh, hidden inside of the shelter. No, we, we get some information about that, and it's cool. pretty crazy. So I like how fast they got to this. But in some of the previous issues, we were also introduced to the, uh, the Kid King in Las Vegas, and he hates Geiger. He wants people to hunt them because he has uh, something happened where he got like basically a handprint on his face from the uh, radioactiveness of Geiger. We see this scene play out too, and it is really cool. So the whole like themed group of the uh, the knights and everything coming to attack Geiger. We see the first time that he tapped into this power that turned him glowing and green and with a skull face. All of that. So it's a little bit of an origin story. Um, it's also a little bit of like what's going on now and how that pertains to what happened before. It is so good. It's so interesting. And some of the revelations in it are crazy um, when you find out about why he's still doing what he's doing. So definitely recommend, I think, I think we have so many people on pull for this now, so they don't need reminding, but some really cool variant covers as well. We have a Jeff Lemire variant. We have, I love this one. This is the uh, Lee Weeks variant. Once again, give me very uh, Fallout game feel. And then we have the Gary Frank variant. I love the line between like superhero and like post-apocalyptic survival this book gets. Very, very cool. Yeah, that is an interesting sort of thing that they've crisscrossed. It's something that I've never seen and it works really well in this. Yeah, and I also like to mention any of you who missed out on issues one and two, they're doing another reprint of mm -hmm. issue one and two that should be out in another week or two. Yeah. So we, we have them on order, and I think it's a new cover art. And really cool. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Detective Comics 1037. So here on the cover, we got Batman, we got Mr. Worth. So what is going on in that? Um, it starts out, Batman is working with Huntress a little bit. They're both trying to figure out uh, what's going on with these murders around Gotham. Some uh, several women have been killed lately, and Huntress has found that one of the people she suspected has these weird parasites in their eyes. Hmm. And so she starts working with Oracle to try to figure that out, which some is revealed about that. Um, so that's the most I could say on that. But uh, Bruce Wayne, he ends up getting held by the police because he had been talking lately with uh, Lydia who had got murdered the previous mm -hmm. issue. And so even as he's being held by police, Mr. Worth finds out 
that he was talking with Lydia. Now, Lydia's not Mr. Worth's daughter. Mr. Worth's daughter is Sarah, one of the other girls who was killed. Mm. He goes off the handles. Like, you'll have to see how crazy Mr. Mm -hmm. Worth is and how crazy his plan is when he learns that Bruce Wayne could be involved. I mean, it's nuts. I couldn't believe it. I was reading, I was like, oh my God, this guy is out of his mind. But of course, he's rich. His daughter was killed. Mm -hmm. If any a time for you to do something with great spectacle, it might be this. And it happens in this issue. Also in this issue was finally the scene I've been waiting for since Detective 1035. Mm -hmm. It has that cover where Batman is fighting Mr. Worth. That finally happens <laughs> in this issue. Two issues too late, in my opinion. But it happens in this issue, if only for the last panel. What's but setting you up for the next issue? Oh, man, they're stringing you along <laughs> to see the Batman-Mr. Worth battle. You know, they're just going to throw money at each other. <laughs> Mr. Worth has definitely been retconned in as an important guy in Gotham, though. Mm -hmm. uh, they keep putting him in, even the backup stories. So this also has two backup stories. The more noteworthy one is by John Ridley. And in it, it's uh, a story of Lucius Fox mm -hmm. back when he first, you know, he's been working for Bruce Wayne for a while, but this is when he first starts working for Batman. Mm. Like when he, when he knows, when Bruce Wayne has revealed it to him. And the story has a lot to do with, he has to help him in a dangerous way, and him and Alfred end up having this discussion about is what Bruce doing altogether good. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there's no discussion on is Bruce helping things, is he trying to fight crime. It has more to do with the Bat family. It has more to do with the Robins, the other people that are getting pulled into this. And you get the sense that Lucius doesn't agree with that part of things. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting. They're really building up Lucius Fox and the Fox family because, you know, that's where all the money ends up. Yeah. That's where all the power ends up. And, of course, you know, that's where next Batman comes from and Batwing. So I think that story is pretty important. Because I've been wondering, with all the, the future state stuff, you know, what what is Lucius, what's in his mind? Yeah. You know, now that he wears the crown, now that he has all the money. And I see where they're angling this. You know, it's not that he disagrees completely with Bruce, but they have some major disagreements on how things should be done. Mm -hmm. So, pretty pretty interesting. And then we have the variant by Lee Bermejo that has Huntress on the cover. A really cool cover, but once again, this this does not actually happen in it. Of course, <laughs> Bermejo's been doing all these awesome covers that... They just let him do... He, they just mentioned, hey, Huntress is in this. Just do something with her in it also. Yeah, so still a really cool cover. Along the Bat Train, we have... Holy first appearances, Batman. Yeah. Batman Urban Legends. This has been making a little, little bit four. of news for some first appearances. Yeah, this is crazy. So this has a few stories in it. The first story is we're still following Red Hood, uh, which I think has been a fantastic story by Chip Zardinsky. And this... Uh, we've been following... This kind of uh, the clues about this new drug on the on the streets called um, cheer, cheer that is essentially like a fear. It, it when they break it down, it's this like the same thing as uh, fear toxin, but instead of like incredible fear, it's like elation and the scary things that that does to people when they're too far in the other direction. Mm. Well, uh, this leads Red Hood to. Mr. Freeze? I feel like that's how what the solic solicitation would say. Um, but it's interesting. So we have a really awesome uh, Red Hood versus Mr. Freeze. And something happens that almost never happens. Uh, uh, give away this little story plot because I thought it was so well handled. Red Hood is really getting his butt handed to him. S such to the degree. Because he's actually talking to... Barbara Oracle the whole time and he gets hurt so bad or something happens and he says get Batman mm. and for Red Hood yeah. to request That's Batman like the, the person like he has that love hate relationship with Bruce that when Barbara contacts Batman who's off doing his own thing she's like 
Jason needs you. And he's like, I'm kind of busy at the moment. She's like, no, he asked for Batman. And then Bruce, or Batman's just <laughs> like, I am on my way. Really, really cool scene. I love the kind of character development that this one has, especially for Red Hood, even the stuff with the kid from the kid. previous issues. I feel like he's getting a lot of character development in this. What did the kid call himself? Blue Hood? Blue Hood, yeah. <laughs> and it is also big in this one because uh, we trace the the cheer toxin or cheer serum or whatever uh, to its source to reveal a new... They are calling it a cameo appearance. It's We can also get into the debates about what's a cameo and what's a first full appearance. They have a line, full costume reveal, full character reveal, of the the man behind the cheer. <laughs> and it's funny, because it's a lot of smiley faces. So there is a first appearance in that, kind of confirmed first appearance. The cheer dealer. The cheer dealer, which is just... Sounds like a it's like a cereal mascot or something. I believe there's a laundry detergent, or it used to be one called Cheer. <laughs> it's like the villain's Procter and Gamble. <laughs> I wish. Um, the another story in this is with uh, Tim Drake, which is really cool because I feel like as of late we don't see a whole lot of Tim Drake. He's been kind of in and out of the Bat books, but in this one, um, he also goes up against a new first appearance of a character called Chaos Master. It has a very interesting design that is chaotic. This isn't Butters from South Park, is no. it? <laughs> no, he doesn't get a throwing star in the eye. Um, so, uh, I won't get too much about that story, but there is a new uh, first appearance in that one. And then we have the um, Grifter story, where, uh, I won't say who it is, but one of the classic um, Wildstorm, Wildcats characters comes into play that we have not seen, probably not since the Wildstorm days. Mm. I don't even think this character appeared in any of the previous iterations of Wildstorm um, at DC. I mean, since like Wildcats and Wildstorm wow. were a thing. Um, not that I can remember it. They may have popped up in a cameo in something or right. whatever, but this seems like they're like, no, it's time to put the next piece of the Wildstorm universe into play. And I think that is really, really exciting because I want all those characters back. Also, really nice variant cover for Batman Urban Legends number four. All right, so... I read Spider-Man, Spider-Shadow, number three. This has been a very cool what-if read, and it even has the new what-if logo up there in the corner. This is by Chip Zdarsky, and it has to do with what if Spider-Man had kept the symbiote suit and Venom had affected him in a very bad way. So in the previous two issues, something terrible happens to Spider-Man. He gets a lot more severe with how he deals with crime. And so the criminals get more severe with him, leading in a death of somebody near and dear to him. And it sets him off to where he decides, uh, partially due to the symbiote he's wearing, mm -hmm. that he can no longer arrest criminals. He has to kill them. So in this... He's already 11 criminals in to <laughs> 11 killing criminals. criminals. Deep. <laughs> yeah, and so the Sinister Stick 6 has come together, and they're like, hey, Spider-Man's killing all of us. We need to reform to survive. Mm -hmm. And they have some new members, which I, I, I'm going to talk about the previous issues. You know, Sorry, I won't spoil this <laughs> one, but the newest member is J. Jonah Jameson which I think is just brilliant. You yeah. Know, like, it's time to get him on a team. Where do he, How far does he really hate Spider-Man? This is the first series, I think, that really gets to go all the way there. He's very proactive now in his hatred. Because they get... He, he, and it's not just him. He's just standing there. Uh -huh. You know, like, I'll put my cigar out on his <laughs> face. He, he gets a advanced suit that's going to make him powerful enough to do something. Um, also, last issue, Doc Ock, who was the previous leader of the team, gets taken out by Eddie Brock, who steals his technology 
And uh, somebody jokingly calls him Brock Ock. Oh, that's such, such a good name. Yeah, so it's the Sinister Six, except Eddie Brock is leading, J. Jonah Jameson's a member. This plays out a lot like a horror movie, um, the sort where the villains are the hunted. It's mm -hmm. that part of the horror movie where the villains are like, oh man, this guy used to be a hero is trying to kill us. Well, let's set a trap in the woods. We'll hunker down and wait for, my, wait for him. And we have our plan. We're going to get him. Mm -hmm. And you get to see all that sort of happen. Now, of course, there's two more issues after this. So obviously nothing goes to plan for anybody. Mm -hmm. But I think the interesting hook for this is how far will J. Jonah Jameson go? Will he really kill Spider-Man? Will he help them kill Spider-Man? You'll have to read about that in, in the issue. Um, also, can they even stop him? I mean, Spider-Man is already tough, and now he has the Venom symbiote helping him. Mm -hmm. So he's a lot more tough than he was by himself. Um, so, And the last thing I'll say is, is, what is the worst thing that the Kingpin could have set up against Spider-Man in the case of his death? And I don't mean Spider-Man's death. I mean in the case of Kingpin's death which pretty much happened last issue. Mm -hmm. So what could he have set up, you know, if, if something happens to me, well, something bad's going to happen to Spider-Man. That happens at the <laughs> end of the issue. You'll have to check that out, too. So very good series. I've really enjoyed reading it. And um, we do not have a variant for that one. Wow. <laughs> yep. Well, I guess I do have another corner that I'm talking about. This is... That, that's the one I thought you were talking about yeah, before. No, I've got many corners now in this room. Uh, this is Star Wars War of the Bounty Hunters. Bounty Hunters. <laughs> is there an echo? War of the Bounty Hunters squared. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is really cool that this is, you know, being the Bounty Hunters of the Bounty Hunters series. Um, this is Valence kind of who's been our protagonist through the the Marvel Bounty Hunter series with um, Dengar, the classic Empire Strikes Back Bounty Hunter. And they are kind of hot on the heels of Boba Fett. Um, they, it even makes reference to, they just got out of a place that um, Boba Fett was in and they're like, oh, all we found was this dead body. And then in the corner it's like, See, uh, War of the Bounty Hunters, number one. It's like, that's how close behind they are. Wow. Trying to track him down. Also on the same planet is uh, Chewbacca and C-3PO. Well, when these worlds collide, Valence and Chewbacca, Chewbacca remembers, hey, this guy, not a good guy. Uh, I remember him uh, kind of double-crossing Han when they were younger. So... As you see on the cover, there is a throwdown between Valence and Chewbacca that is great. It's super cool to see that happen. And the whole time, Dengar's like, okay, y'all keep doing that. I'm going to go get a drink. And he's like watching the whole thing while getting a drink. Um, really fun installment. So since the last issue came out, we kind of know who the... Um, not the big bad, but kind of the organization behind everything, which is Crimson Dawn. Um, if you know a lot about Star Wars, you know the history of that. I probably still won't give away who the big reveal was at the end, even though everybody probably knows. But, uh, in multiple ways, the different characters in the, this book find out that Crimson Dawn is the ones who currently have, uh, Han frozen in carbonite. And when they find out that Crimson Dawn has them, it reveals someone has been watching them. And this, uh, places are claiming, is the first appearance of a new character that they give a name of Death Stick. Right. I don't know... Th this is other sites. We, yeah. We, we go all over for information. Yeah. I, we, I read it and then I'm like, has anyone else noticed this? Um, so this... It's easy to find on the cover of the next issue shows Valence fighting her on it. And I'm not sure if Death Stick is going to be your name, just my own Star Wars knowledge goes with a character really name themselves after like a drug, which is what Death Sticks are in the Star Wars universe. Um, I've got some theories who I think this character may be, um, because it's very hard to tell what they look like based on their outfit, but 
potentially a first appearance of a of a completely new character, you know, unless they take off their hood and it's, you know, a job of the hut sucking in his gut or something, but no, that working out. <laughs> and there's a there's a pretty jacked uh hut in this is it's really great. But yeah, another great installment in the War of the Bounty Hunters whole arc. I feel like it's cool to see all of these people on the same goal going forward and how they kind of cross over and they're right behind each other. So really good. We've got a few variants for this. So we have the Pride Month variant, which I love this one. I think the colors on this one are great. We have the Star Wars or the Lucasfilm anniversary cover. And then also wanted to mention this also came out, this is a second printing of War of the Bounty Hunters Alpha. That uh, Pretty much the same cover, but with the colors in the background are now gray. So I have a lot of people who want to get every cover, yeah, every printing. You know, more than ever, consecutive printings are, are a thing now. So you'll want to check your store to see if they have the second printing of Alpha number one. All right, so I read Good Asian number two. Number one had a lot of really good reviews, people throwing around terms about award winning and such. This is one of those comics, it's it's not for everybody. If you like just superhero stuff, um, I would stay away. This is not superhero stuff. This is hard-boiled detectives from the 50s stuff. <laughs> um, but the storytelling is great. The art is really good. And so let me tell you a little bit about it. So, of course, this is set back in... As I said, hard-boiled 1950s. It follows our protagonist. Um, the, the title calls him the Good Asian, which is a little bit tongue-in-cheek mm -hmm. as to what what is that. But he is an an Asian who works with the police force to try to mitigate problems that happen in the Asian sector of town, where the police used to just crack heads and mm -hmm. just try to rule by the fact that you know, you know, they were different. Uh, instead, he's sort of like, I'm on your side, but hey, don't just go killing mm -hmm. people or, or busting heads. The end of last issue, a little kid revealed to him there was a dead body down in sort of like a storm drain sort of mm -hmm. area. And it was a, a white man who had been hacked up to death with mm -hmm. something sharp. So this left him in a moral dilemma as to do I tell the police this is here because this is right in the Asian district. This could cause a big problem. Or do I keep it to myself? Because after so long, somebody's going to find this. Yeah. And then I'm not going to be there to try to negotiate this. Well, you'll see how this plays out in this issue. I'm not going to tell you how that goes. Um, they get right to that, though. They, they don't beat around the bush. Um, on top of that, a few of the things happen in this issue, just I'll tell you to, to tantalize you. Mm -hmm. There is a story about a Asian gangster who 30 years prior used to kill people with a hatchet and cut out their eyes and he promised he would come back one day to go after family members all right so hmm guy found killed cut up and then this story comes up well what happens where there's a crowded nightclub and somebody in a sort of comical mask you'll have to see starts hacking up people right mm. in the middle of a crowd with a hatchet. Um, you know, obviously a lot of uh, mystery and danger mm -hmm. in this issue. So the most I'll say is if, if you've read the first one, you liked it, you will like this one. This is this very much follows the, the feeling of the first one. And uh, if you didn't read the first one, I hope my description mm -hmm. helps you decide if it's for you or not. Here is the variant. This is the Wu variant. The variants for the series have been really good, too. I mean, this is, you know, just that old-style movie poster. Yeah. Just that sort of 50s-style movie poster right there. Cool. So, another one. Go over just real quick. This is Future State Gotham number two. This The first issue of this was a surprise when we opened it. That it is all black and white, but it has a very manga feel to it. And this continues that. Uh, I think in the best way. I I think this is a really refreshing style for this. Um, this picks up with 
you know, this is about Jason Todd from the future state timeline who may or may not be working for the magistrate. Um, I mean, we kind of know he's not, but he's kind of, that's how he's managed to survive is yeah. to act like he's working for them. Yep. He is deep undercover. Yes. Dangerously deep undercover. Dangerously where even some of the people who used to be closest with him don't necessarily know his allegiances anymore. Yeah. And that includes uh, his bat brothers and sisters, which... Um, basically say at the end of the last one, we need to, we need to have a family meeting. The, the big rooftop meeting. Yes. Yeah. Um, I was listening to an interview with, uh, Joshua Williamson about this and he's like, I want to bring all of the back characters into this. I want to see like what the future state version of everyone involved in Batman would be in this future state version. So we definitely get a lot of that. Um, characters that we left off with in future state, like Tim Drake. When we left off Tim Drake, he had kind of fallen into a vat of like this this Lazarus venom serum that uh, was, was kind of surprising that the series ended with him kind of just rising up out of it, and we didn't know right. really what happened with him. His story is picked up in this as as well as everyone else's from where we last left him in Future State. But I just think the Tim Drake one's interesting because it's mentioned that uh, Red Hood is like, hey, I've heard you're immortal now, which I think is kind of cool. It's like, oh, all those future state stuff, it's not like they just ended. We're still getting payoffs for those. It's still rewarding if you read those issues. Um, but this uh, also has Jason Todd confronting Bruce Wayne. And I'm not sure the timeline, if this takes place after... Detective, I believe Detective was the last Bat story we had. Dark Detective. Dark Detective, where we didn't know if he survived or not. I'm not sure if this takes place before or after that, but um, it definitely feels like it's continuing that story, which is cool that that's, that's uh, still going on. And also, Jason Todd makes, takes a trip to uh, Blackgate Asylum, where he confronts some more uh, of Batman's classic villains, but now are kind of uh, future statified, or what What are they doing here now? So, really cool issue. I still, I think the art is awesome. I think it's really exciting, the, the direction this is going, and kind of new ground it's breaking. So, we have just one variant for it. I believe this is uh, Kale New. All right, so I read Justice League Last Ride number two. This is the miniseries by Chip Zdarsky that is set in sort of an alternate possible future for the Justice League where something terribly tragic happened. At least one of their members died, and it caused a huge rift between Superman and Batman. Well, something new comes up where the team has to get back together. And what that new thing is that was revealed in issue number one is Lobo was finally captured by uh, the Guardians. And they are so afraid that his enemies are going to kill him before trial. They're like, Justice League, can you hide him? Can you, mm -hmm. can you protect Lobo <laughs> until we take him to trial? Mm -hmm. And so this brings the Justice League back together, particularly Batman and Superman begrudgingly come back together. And in this one, they're traveling through space because they've decided the best place to hide Lobo is Apocalypse, which is the uh, planet that used to be the home for Darkseid. So as they're traveling, we get a lot of backstory as to what happened in the past. This all, I, I will say, has to do with Darkseid invading Earth. And I think that's some of why they think it's the last place mm -hmm. a lot of the villains would expect them to go. So Darkseid was invading Earth. It was really, really bad. You get to see where all the Justice League members were because they were not just together. They were all over the place trying to stop this. He wasn't just going for Earth. Darkseid was going for different parts of the universe. Um, you'll, you'll have to read the same. And you, you get to see where everyone is. You, you, it's still not fully revealed everything that goes down. They're definitely going to slow feed this to us. But I'm really interested in all that. I think it's done really well. And um, 
I, I'm building an idea of what happened each mm -hmm. time. And I, I like that. I like when things are, are rolled out slowly, but in a manner that keeps you guessing and keeps you uh, enticed. Mm -hmm. um, so as they're headed to drop Lobo off, of course, Lobo is cutting barbs into them. He's mm -hmm. revealing things, and he's <laughs> saying stuff that you know only a, a jerk like him would say. Yeah. But some of it might be true. Some of it might be accurate. Um, so we know that one league member died. We know that for sure. But this issue reveals there might have been more than one that mm -hmm. died. It doesn't completely reveal it, but, I mean, it leaves a couple of them pretty bad off. So it might be, because I'll also say, notably, there are certain Justice League members who haven't been in this yet. Mm -hmm. So I'm starting to think there are multiple ones that died in the past. So, um, and then, of course, what does Darkseid have to do with the whole thing? Is he still around? Did they finally defeat him? You know, who, who knows? So this is just another cool issue of this by uh, Chip Zdarsky. And we have the variant by Enoch Lee. Showing them all kind of I love the hooded uh, Kilowog. Yep. Really cool. And, you know, they, they caught Lobo. So this, this didn't happen in this issue, but maybe this happened off screen in issue zero. There was an issue zero, but like, you know, when, when <laughs> yeah. they caught Lobo. So another big book that... Uh took the place by storm last month eve the new book from boom uh this is issue two so in issue one we have this setup with this world where there's been some kind of environmental cataclysm event that has left the world covered in water up to like really high up and this girl wakes up out of as you can see there named eve wakes up in this vat and is confronted by a, a robotic teddy bear that basically says, like, uh, I don't know, she, she has all these memories, and he keeps suggesting that those didn't, act, that those were kind of programmed into her. Uh, and this kind of builds, it builds off this idea where she is now going to go out looking for her um, dad, who... The last she remembers, you know, put her in this vat, but did that really happen? Um, and we find out more about what caused this cataclysm. It's a very uh, environmentalist, you know, it, it talks a lot about the ice caps melting and basically using up resources has caused all this. Um, but it's not all that because they set out on their journey on their little raft where they're going between these buildings and... Let's just say that there are, uh, not everyone died, and not everything that died is still dead. Hmm. So you kind of see what some of the uh, challenges are going to be in this world, which is really, I was surprised when, when that started happening, but you also see this bear, what kind of, uh, what kind of super up powers this robot bear has? I mean, there's one part where they're like carrying their luggage to the the little boat, and he's got these like really jacked up arms, like carrying <laughs> luggage. It's really cool. But then what happens when he actually has to help Eve and defend her? Um, really cool. So I think a lot of people really like number one or excited. Going to be picking up number two. But if your store sold out of number one. There is a second printing of Eve number one with a new cover. I'm grabbing that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, really cool, I love this Dan Mora variant, which you get some more ideas of what's lurking in the water. We have the 1 in 10, the Virgin Dan Mora variant. Also, uh, there was a tree on the cover of a lot of the number one's issues. We find out about that tree. It's, it's more than just a little thing. It could be the hope of the earth is this tree. So you'll have to check that out. I thought that part was really, really cool. And then we have the 1 in 25 Young variant. 
that we are selling for at 35. All right, so I read Children of the Atom number four today. This issue, like the previous one, follows one of the members of the Children of the Atom. In this one, it follows Benny, who is Marvel guy. You see him there wearing the green sort of uh, front and bottom center. He has, of course, telekinetic abilities. And, um, you know, so each issue follows them on very much a personal level. It, o it always goes into their superheroing, but it starts out, they're at home, they're at mm. school. Who are they? What thoughts are in their head? They usually narrate it themselves. And with Benny, he is very much, he is a true loner. He doesn't really like people a lot. He only likes people that he considers family, which would be his actual family and also the members of the Children of the Atom. Mm. Pretty much everybody else, uh, he, he's a little bit of a grumpy guy, and he has his reasons for it. This issue, we also get to see, without a doubt, where their powers come from. Which we were hoping would be in the last one, so but... The last issue, I will say, in its defense, it pretty much revealed where the powers okay. came from. But I wanted to see the full thing. Mm -hmm. It was one thing to be like, oh, there's a spaceship that you guys found. Okay, well, spaceship can have something on it that changes into you into a mutant. It can have many things yeah. on it. I'm not saying that's what it does. <laughs> uh, this issue, you find out without a doubt where their powers come from. That's what I'll say because you get to see them mm -hmm. doing things with them early on. You get to see them using different ones than they might even have right now. Oh, wow. Uh, so that's cool. I'm glad they finally revealed that. It really solidifies that. And in this issue, they learn about the Hellfire Gala. And they decide, hey, this is our chance to break into Kokoa because um, since they're inviting celebrities and non-mutants, there might be a way to get through the gate yeah. and, and not be noticed. So um, past learning about Benny, they're going to try to do that. But I have to tell you, things don't go real well. There are people that are after them. And by the end of the issue, they are in dire straits. Uh, some, some really bad stuff goes down to where the youngest member of the team may have to save them all and to do that he may have to contact the real x-men mm. to come and save them i hope it doesn't uh, mess up their their, their, their fun at the at the gala yeah. so um still cool issue i've been enjoying the series i don't think the series was what most people expected and i i'm glad i want something to go beyond my expectations yeah you know everybody's looking for the new first appearance of characters that are going to stick around this is showcasing each of these characters one at a time and really mm -hmm. getting into them. I don't know how none of these characters will stick around after this. I, I feel like it, it might be a while, but, I mean, I, I think these are good ones to, to grab and hold on to, personally. Yeah. Then we have the Chang variant to this one. Okay, one to go over just really fast. We have Wonder Woman number 773. 773. And we are wrapping up the story of uh, the Asgardian adventures of Wonder Woman, where she's lost her memories post uh, Infinite Frontier and is slowly kind of getting little glimpses here and there of, uh, of maybe things aren't right, maybe what she's supposed to be she's having her own heroes reborn she's over having, there yeah as heroes are born are, are, are having their own wonder woman yes um so it's teasing the last one that she was going to find the valkyries and in this one uh the valkyries may also look a little familiar really cool but this does wrap up that um first story arc and with a cliffhanger on the last page that i think is going to be really interesting to see what comes out of it because i think wonder woman is a very important character right now because like what happens when wonder woman eventually shows back up in the right. main right. universe right. they haven't completely addressed what happened to her but there's been talk about like she's gone like she kind of ascended to right. this god level um she may be getting closer and closer to coming back to the the main DC universe and I think that's going to be a big deal when that happens. Uh, it also has some really awesome variants. So, we have the Middleton variant. 
just beautiful with her her new Asgardian uh, friend that she's made, maybe telling him goodbye. And then we have the Pride variant, which is really nice, super colorful, really cool. All right, also from DC, Batman the Detective number three is out. So last issue, Batman discovered his, one of his former mentors, Henri Descartes, had been shot and was bleeding very badly. And this issue, he's going to try to save his life, get him to the hospital. Um, but who is Henri Descartes? He is the world's greatest manhunter, according mm -hmm. to Bruce. And this shows a lot of their backstory. Ducard has been in other Batman things. Mm -hmm. He was also in the movies. Yeah. So we're sort of different. But he has been in the Batman books before. He has been the one who supposedly trained Batman on how good he is to um, hunt down people, to locate, yeah. track people. So this goes all the way back into their past. Bruce Wayne is a young man again. It shows how he is able to get Ducard to agree to train him some of which has to do with being very wealthy and having a lot of money to pay this man who isn't quite as scrupulous as Batman. Yeah. He's definitely not a bad guy. But the rub comes where Bruce sees Descartes do something that he will never do. Mm -hmm. This issue has a lot to do with uh, Bruce Wayne's feelings towards guns mm -hmm. and his feelings towards killing, even if it is a criminal. So I think it's really interesting to explore that because that's a big part of Batman that people, I mean, in almost any conversation, eventually somebody's going to go, why doesn't Batman kill? And yeah. why, you know, um, I, I know Frank Miller definitely wondered that when he was <laughs> writing Dark Knight Returns. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't believe that part. Um, and so this is showing Bruce Wayne younger talking with somebody who feels differently about that. And this sets them against each other. This explains... Well, hmm, this Descartes person is such a big deal to Bruce Wayne. Why do we never see him? There's a good reason you don't yeah. ever see Descartes. He doesn't want to be found. And they have a major disagreement where if Bruce ever sees him, may have to turn him over to the authorities <laughs> by his own moral code. Uh, so this issue also, it, funny enough, it ends with something that happens very similar to Detective Comics. Mm. You know, and I, I mean, I just think it's a coincidence. But if you read Detective Comics this week and you read Batman the Detective, you're going to notice that two things happen that don't often happen to Bruce Wayne in both the issues, which is I thought was kind of funny. Um, he still, eats birthday cake. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's it. <laughs> that, that's, that's where the surprise of Batman is he eats birthday cake. But here is our variant cover for Batman the Detective number three. This uh, variant, this is the uh, Kubert variant. Is that the first time the new Squire has been on a cover? I don't believe so. And I meant to mention, yeah, so there is the new Squire, which I, I will also say, uh, this does not happen in this book. Um, Batman has been hanging out with the new Squire, but this has so much to do with stuff in the past uh -huh. and him getting Descartes to the hospital that the Squire is not really in this. <laughs> so cool cover, but yeah. you know, she's in other, she was in the other yeah. ones. Uh, lastly, I have... What a lot of people have been waiting for, I had some people come in today and say, do you have Batman <laughs> Fortnite? And I said, what issue do they need? And they said, all of them. And all I said, them. well, I can handle that. Yeah. Uh, at least up until issue number four. So they put out, this is the third printing of number one, just with a uh, white cover on the back. And we also have number four second printing that now has a black background. And these both do come with the codes that are still, you can still use in the Fortnite game. Um, but a lot of people who missed out, especially on the number one, number one, very hard yeah. to get. Um, they had us retailers order the second print before the first was even out. Yes. So basically retailers didn't order enough of those. Mm -hmm. So the third, this is our first chance to yeah, really order so this knowing how many people yeah, want now it. we have this on the wall for people. You can get it so you can get the whole set. Also, it's just a really fun read. Um, getting a lot of new people into comics, into Batman. So if you've been waiting till you can catch up, 
it's finally available to to catch up on the series. All right, I got a few. I just want to go over real quick. So Black Widow number six has gone back to second print, which is great because people have been looking for this one high and low. It is the first appearance of a new character, Lucy Wynn, who is being trained by the White Widow right now and a bit by the Black Widow. So a lot of people think that she may stick around. She might end up a character like them. And on top of that, last issue it was revealed that she has some sort of powers. So um, this was her first appearance. So second print of it out today. She also has a nickname. Black Widow calls her Marigold mm. because she was um, at a flower. She, she met her at a flower place selling marigolds. Um, also, Layla Star number one has gone to third print. So if you're interested in getting all the prints of this, just wanted to make sure everybody knew about that. And the last one I wanted to talk about is this is going to be a hard one to find. The big surprise. Yes, this is the surprise of the week. Web of Spider-Man number one. This is a comic that ties in with a new ride at Disneyland. Yes. So not even the one in Florida near us. We're in Tennessee. The one way out in California. <clears throat> and apparently retailers didn't order enough of this book. We talked about on Comics from the Future, and we had all of maybe one pre-order. <laughs> So, I mean, you know, some of this is not retailer's fault. Don't yeah. get mad if your store doesn't have enough of it. Some of it is people are not saying that they want it. But this ends up having a couple first appearances. There's a group called Brigade in it. But more than that, there is uh, the kid. I can't remember what his name is. Mm -hmm. But he was the kid in Iron Man 3, which, funny enough, that part of the movie took place in Chattanooga, where we're from. Yeah. They were insulting Chattanooga, saying that our internet's terrible, which is funny. We actually have some of the fastest internet in the world. Yep. So We're, we're a little cold to Iron Man 3 around here. <laughs> I, I was laughing at the theater when they were insulting the internet, and it's like, I have some of the fastest internet in the world in my house. <laughs> I guess they didn't uh, look up where's the fastest internet in the U.S. At the time, it was us. Yeah. Um, but anyway... People are looking for this book high and low. This is the A cover. It's going for $25-ish right now. Mm -hmm. um, we have next to none of these left. So just, you know, we, we did a show not just to sell things, but also to let everybody know what to look for in the wild. So you may want to grab this up. It seems people are caring more about it than mm -hmm. expected because of these first appearances. Will it retain heat? I don't know. Is the story good? I didn't read it yet, so I can't tell you. Just wanted you to know about it. And uh, that is our show for this Ooh. week. Yep. This is not a huge week, but a pretty, a pretty a, a decent solid, sized week. Solid middle of the road yeah. week. You know, not a ton of number ones, but still a lot of strong series mm -hmm. that are going on. So a thanks. lot of strong issues within series that have been going on, which. A lot of people miss out on those. Yeah, when it comes to these like number twos and threes and fours, we want to tell people what's been going on so that way you can jump into something mm -hmm. and not feel like you don't know anything at all. But still know that the latest one, we didn't tell you everything. Yeah. All right, well, thank you all for joining us. I hope you enjoy these uh, spoiler-free reviews as much as we enjoy making them. It is a lot of work, but I'm not going to complain you know, sure, we each have to read, like, 12 comics yeah. in the span of a few hours. And then act like we're the authority <laughs> on them. And the whole so, time in my mind, I'm like, wait, did this happen in this book or this book? Somebody's got to do it. Somebody's yeah. got to do it. And we appreciate you guys tuning in every week to hear what we have to say on this. Um, I think we're nearing 920 subscribers now on YouTube. So we're creeping up. We will hit that thousand someday. And then we'll do something super special. Uh, but thank you. Tune in this Friday when we do Comics from the Future, where we will talk about upcoming issues that are open order. Like, for instance, when we talked about Web of Spider-Man. Uh, we talked about it and people said, nah. That, that's your chance <laughs> to order as many as you want of things. We'll tell you why we think they might be important. With that one, we said it was linked in with the theme park. Mm -hmm. We obviously didn't know about the first appearances. Sometimes they give us um, early issues, and yeah. we read them all. You know, most stores don't do that. We read everything early that we can. So we'll dish that out on Friday. But uh, thank you very much, and we will see you next time.